Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us uh, on this October 1st Azure Thursday meetup. Um, my name is Joad Meyer, and together with Ruland here, I will be your host for tonight. How are you? Are you I'm well? Good. I'm very excited for tonight. Cool. Yeah, excellent. Well, we have some awesome speakers lined up for tonight, so it will be really nice. Um, so we have Heine coming up first. And she will tell us about um, Azure Synapse Analytics, which is the um, former Azure Data Warehouse. And then the second session will be uh, from Dave. And he will also talk about well, big data kind of solutions, pitching them against each other. Uh, and he will uh, be talking about uh, Synapse Analytics as well, but also Databricks and Data Factory. So that will be really awesome. So. I'm looking really forward to it tonight. How are you uh, feeling, uh, Roland? I'm very excited. I've never used Azure Synapse with with customers in production, um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing more about it and just to ask the difficult difficult questions. I'm yeah, very, well, very excited. Yeah. That will be easy for us, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's best to bring Heine in and uh, and see what's uh, what's her session about. Yeah, Heine, we're, we're so, so happy you could be could join us uh, today. Uh, you could be uh, be here with us all the way from Finland, right? So how yeah. are you doing? I'm doing very well here. Uh, it's getting kind of into that time of darkness. So it's nice to have these interactions going on once in a while in the evenings and get some light into the days. See some friendly faces. Exactly. Yeah. yeah well. Uh, you, you work at Atia, right, as a cloud yes. structure architect? Could, could you tell us yes. something more about your current role? So I work here at Atea with different kinds of customer projects. I am uh, in our information management team, so it means that I'm working very extensively with customers on their da data platform projects on Azure specifically, and of course hybrid environments. Those Those come around all the time. And I've also worked quite a lot with uh, infrastructure side of things. So just virtual machines and virtual networking and things like that. And that's pretty much why I get really excited about architecture and how we set these platform services in a secure manner as well and make kind of put them up the right way. Very cool. But you're a Microsoft certified trainer as well. Uh, and you yes. just recently did your first real uh, MCT training, right? The, 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 I think it was a security one. Yeah, that's that's correct. I actually, from from my previous life, I studied to be a math teacher, and I, I did some teaching while I was studying and things like that. So I've done the whole teaching thing quite extensively, and then it was just a very natural progression for me to go for the Microsoft, Microsoft certified trainer as well, and now I'm also one of the trainers for, for us internally in Atea for uh, having having our consultants get up to speed with their skills on Azure. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. And you ride bikes, right? You're very yeah. a very good bike rider. <laughs> yes. Is it only BMX? I, I, I read BMX somewhere, but... Yeah, I, I do ride. Actually, right now I'm riding less BMX and more mountain bikes. Uh, Kind of all the riding downhills fast and thing like things like that. It's a good way to get your mind clear after a day at work, and you can't really think of anything else. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I think I think we know you a little bit better now, and yeah. and, and if you're ready for it, then the, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Thanks. So let's get started here. So welcome everybody from my my point of view as well. Today we're gonna talk about Azure Synapse Analytics and specifically about architecting Azure Synapse Analytics. And for me, that is the ultimate jigsaw because I love puzzles and there are many parts to it and many things to consider. So it's an exciting service to work with because you have to deal with many parts with it. And as you might all remember, uh, Azure Synapse Analytics was announced last year at Ignite in November. 
Um, if you were like me, you kind of dashed into the Azure portal right away and went looking for Azure Synapse Analytics. And what you would find there was Synapse Analytics, but it was actually the old data warehouse. It had just changed, it, changed its name overnight. And that was a bit, bit of a, a bummer for me because I was so excited to get started. But now we are, are have moved on a bit in time-wise and we can find Synapse in the Azure portal. But the thing is when we go searching for it and we want to get it up, there's actually multiple things with this name on it. And we can probably find out with a little bit of Googling and starting from there that it is the workspace that we want to work with. We don't want just the old data warehouse. We want all the cool new stuff that has to do with working with your data. And also when we get our service up, there's the thing that there are many terms and many parts to it. So it can be a little difficult to know where to start with your environment, which parts you need for your real environment and how to use them together. So that is really the goal for my session. And that's why we're first going to look at the different components of Azure Synapse Analytics and see how, what do you use them for? Then we are going to look at securing Azure Synapse Analytics. So how you really put Azure Synapse up in the right way. And today we're going to look at networking and access control. And then lastly, we're going to see how you put those together from the first two parts, just looking at the components and then securing uh, Synapse with networking and access control. Then we're going to see how it all fits together and what to do with it. And as you already heard, I am Heini Ilmarinen and I work for Atea Finland. I am a Microsoft certified trainer. And as I said, I really like puzzles and solving problems. And so architecture is the part that I really love about Azure and especially because it's so challenging and you have to keep up to speed all the time. And also I did study math, so I'm a bit of a math nerd at heart. And if any, one wants to have any math discussions, I'm always up for it. And as we move along, you might see that I'm a bit of a doodler and will draw pictures on anything I get my hands on. So let's get started with the components of Azure Synapse Analytics and just look at what they are and what you do with them. So when you do put your service up, you will find many different parts to the Synapse Analytics, like pipelines, private endpoints, Spark pools, SQL, different flavors of that, and linked services, and all kinds of different things. But to figure out what you need to do with those and how you set them up can be a little difficult. It can feel a little confusing. How do I get started? And what do these do? And to really answer that question, I want to take a step back and look at what a data prop, kind of a regular data project in, is and what kind of phases we have in there. And if we think, think of the phases that we need to do when we want to work with data and we want to produce something out of it, it means that in that beginning, we of course have some kind of data sources where we want to pull the data in from. And we need to ingest that data somehow. I need so, so sorry oh. to have to interrupt you. Yeah. Not sure. But there's a weird ticking sound on the mic. And oh. maybe we could we could try uh, unplugging the mic and plugging it back in because uh, yes. basically when we tested it was all fine, but but now there's a a small ticking noise. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, that's it. Okay. It oh, works. But back. <laughs> oh no, what is that? That's strange. Yes, it is. Let's just do one more time. And we can all hear you, that's perfect, but it's just it's a it's a, it's a constant ticking. So if we can fix it then it's then it's even better. Yes. But we'll just move along. Is this better now? Or no, is it back? Yeah, really? I think Weird. Luke is going to try to, to re-add you to the stream to try if that helps. And 
I can dash and grab my headphones as well. That is one option as well. It'll be 10 seconds. Oh, perfect, yeah. So sorry to have to put you through this, but... No problem. I just love that you get run into these technical problems once in a while. <laughs> Adds to, to the challenge of it. Well, let's see. I'm going to try switching over to my headphones, if right. that helps. Or is the sound already better? No, it's still there. It's really weird. It's a weird ticking, almost a cricket-like sound. I think it's gone now. OK, perfect. Perfect. Thank then you the so headphones much. are better. No problem. Yeah, it's nicer to listen to if there's no kind of extra noise on the background. Yes, it is. All right. So where Thank were you. we? We were talking about the data project phases that we walk through when we're setting up a data platform or starting to work with any kind of data. So we start with some data sources where we want to pull our data in from. And that means we have to ingest it in some way. In most cases, we also want to prep the data in some way, which most of the time mean for, means, for example, doing some validation on the data, doing some cleanup, uh, removing some kind of faulty values or anything like that, kind of to get that data ready for the next stages. And most of the time, we also don't just want to bring in the data in the form that it has been in the source system, but we also want to do some transformations to that data. And, and for example, just combine it with some data from other data sources as well, and create new kind of data that we can then serve to our end, end goal. And then, of course, as the last phase, we need to store the data somewhere where we can then take it for wherever we want to consume it. Uh, a lot now in our projects, there's visualization as the first step to just get started with, with having visibility to your data and finding those things. But then, of course, later on, that could be anything that is the consumer at the very end, whether it's a web app or creating some machine learning models or anything like that. And of course, as we're moving through these phases, all along the way, we need to store our data somewhere. And it has to move between these phases and always get stored on the way as we move through. So where does Azure Synapse Analytics fit in? It really kind of covers all the phases of these data processing. And with Azure Synapse Analytics, what we can do is cover all, all the phases from ingestion to preparation to transforming and serving and even visualizing. And since we have so many different things that can be done with Synapse, even though it is one service, it does mean that we have different kinds of functionality within Synapse and we have to know how to manage these and what to do with them and how to work with them to get a functional data platform. If you've been working with the Azure data services before, you know that previously to get this kind of process, you needed to have several different services. For example, you could use Azure Data Factory for the ingestion, you could use Databricks for preparation and transformation, for example, and serve your data from an Azure SQL. But now all these functionalities can be found within Azure Synapse Analytics. And what really makes this different from the perspective of where you have these multiple services and you have to handle them all separately is that we have some things that are unified with all the functionalities of Synapse Analytics. And that means that we have one user interface that you need to use or you can use, which is the Azure Synapse Studio. So 
you can be working in just this one tool, working through all of the phases of this data projects. And you don't necessarily have to use different tools, but you also can use different tools if you want to. And more importantly for Azure Synapse Analytics, since we have so many phases to the data project, we can also do the monitoring from one place. We can see if something goes wrong in our pipeline from whatever phase, whether, whether it's in the ingestion or in the transformation. Even if we're using different functionalities of Azure Synapse, we can still see the monitoring from one place. Also to add to that, this means that we have the management as one unified way. And this will make uh, kind of um, monitoring and managing this environment much more easy when it is all from one unified place and you don't have to poke around different services to find out what's, what's wrong, especially in those situations where you have to find out what has happened. But as we did say, there are many parts to this and somehow we have to make sense about what those parts are and what you can do with the different functionalities that we can find within Synapse. And if we look at kind of uh, zone in into just the Synapse Analytics part, we can find three different parts. And even if we're, when we're talking through these three different parts, just remember, we always have those three things in common that we can use. We can use the Azure Synapse Studio, we can do the management and monitoring from one place, still even though these are these, there are these different parts. And in general, we can find three layers. We have the data layer, which is where we will be storing the data. Then there is the orchestration layer, which is mainly for moving data, uh, scheduling things to be done at certain times, and so on. And then we have analytics engines that we can use for uh, working with our data. And if we start from the very bottom of the stack, from the storing of data, this is where Azure Synapse Analytics gets linked with Azure Data Lake Storage. So when we do create an Azure Synapse Analytics workspace, we have to either create a new Azure Data Lake Storage, which will be linked with that workspace, or we can link an existing Azure Data Lake Storage to it. But anyways, whenever we create Synapse, we do need an Azure Data Lake Storage underneath it. And this is kind of the main, main platform where we can be storing our data, especially when it's in flat file format and, and kind of the raw data, data part of our data processing. Then of course, we do, since we do have to move data around in some way, we need the orchestration layer as well. And in the orchestration layer, uh, we have pipelines. And if you have worked with Azure Data Factory before, the pipeline side of things in Azure Synapse Analytics will look exactly the same to you as Azure Data Factory. And on the background, these two do share the same code base as well. So they are uh, developed side by side and they have some of the same functionalities. But of course, Azure Synapse Analytics is still in preview. So it means that there can be some features in Synapse that are not in Azure Data Factory. And with the pipelines, it's good to remember that it is not just about moving data around. With the pipelines, you can also do all those tasks of triggering, for example, some transformation on data at a specific schedule and then have that stored in just a different area of the da same data storage, for example. And we can link these tasks together. And since we only, or only have an hour today, uh, I'm not gonna go more into details on the pipelines, but if you do want to find out more about that, you can find that in the documentation and even look into the Azure Data Factory documentation because that will all apply for Azure Synapse Analytics as well. Then if we move to the analytics engines, this is where we can do all, make all the magic happen with the data. So we have the data stored in Azure Data Lake Storage. We can move it around with pipelines and trigger some transformations on it. But how do we do the analytics on this data? 
And when we do create an Azure Synapse Analytics workspace, when you create it in the first phase, you get out of the box, you get the pipelines and the SQL, SQL on demand. As it kind of says on the tin, on its name, it is kind of uh, SQL whenever you need it. So it's not any kind of reserved capacity for you, but it can scale in a very large, large scale and even process very large amounts of data. But since it is on demand, it is possible that if you have not used it for a while, you do have to wait a few moments for the first query to run through again. But with SQL on demand, you get all those relational database capabilities that you need for querying. It is not exactly the same kind of storage as Azure SQL. So you can only have views and external tables in the SQL on demand database, but you can have those. So you can have some data in the SQL on demand engine as well. For SQL, we also have a second option, which is where you might get a little bell ringing from previously from the data warehouse is the SQL provision pool. And this is what used to be Azure Data Warehouse, and which you can also still see separately in the portal as Azure Synapse Analytics, formerly known as Data Warehouse. And the difference from this to the SQL on demand is that this is a provision pool. So you do specify what kind of capacity you need, and then you have that capacity until you pause that, that capacity or you scale it down or you scale it up and so on. So with the SQL pool, you do not have that automation to scaling how much capacity you need at this point. So you kind of have to do that manually or create it so that it is done programmatically for starting and stopping and scaling and so on. But with that one, you know you have some provision capacity and since it is the data warehouse, you can have all those capabilities that you used to have in Azure Data Warehouse previously as well. And this part of Azure Synapse Analytics is completely generally available. So that part is not in preview since the service has been around for a long time and it has just been rebranded and given more functionality on top of it. In addition to the SQL engines, there is also the Spark engine there to work with. And this is uh, similar to the SQL pool in that way that this is also provisioned. You specify how much capacity you need to use and, but there's some automation to, for example, scaling and when you want the uh, cluster to go inactive or kind of sleep. So with that, you can specify some automation to when it when you're not using it, it just goes idle and you don't have to pay for it. With the Spark side, of course, you, you get all those capabilities of working with your data with PySpark or Scala and so on. So there are some things that you get much more capabilities to work with by bringing that Spark pool into your options as well. And the fun thing with having all these different options for what analytics engine you use is that you can query uh, across with these different types. So with the SQL on demand, for example, you can query in Azure data lake storage. So even when you have completely flat data, you can use the SQL on demand engine to query that and kind of find out things about your data very quickly with the SQL language. And then again, on the other side, with having the Spark pools, if you have your database linked to Azure Synapse Analytics, then you can also query that with the Spark pool as well. So you can kind of cross-reference with these tools, the types of storages that they don't link so easily when you have those separate services. So I get my slide to change here. Come on. So if we look at how this then fits into the different phases of 
the data project where you're bringing data in and prepping and transforming and serving it, then these different parts of the service fit into the different layers. So the Azure Data Lake storage is a storage layer underneath everything. It is, if you want to be really exact, it's not really part of Azure Synapse Analytics, but you link that service to Azure Synapse Analytics. But you could still work with that data lake from other places as well. For all the orchestration tasks, whether it's in the ingestion phase or, or preparation or transforming or serving, you use the pipelines for all of that. And that, that is where you kind of have get the different tasks of what is done to the data and in what order. And then for the analytics engines, you could pretty much use any of the three for any phase, but there could be situations where using one would be smarter than using the other one. For example, if you're just doing some ad hoc queries, it's really easy to use the SQL on-demand engine and just kind of, it's there for you right away and you can just do some queries to your data right away. And of course, if you want to bring in the visualization layer as well, Power BI can be uh, integrated and brought into Synapse so you can work with your Power BI workspaces directly from in there. So now, now we have kind of gone through all the different parts of Azure Synapse Analytics and what are their kind of top level use cases and how to use them. Now we can move on to how to secure Azure Synapse Analytics. And the thing is, if you're just setting a proof of concept environment for yourself and all that, it doesn't really matter how you set it up. But if you bring in more people working with your data and you have a bigger team and you have more data sources, it gets more tricky to have that done in a uh, controlled way. So as I said, today we will be looking at networking and access control. But why do we want to talk about networking and access control when we're talking about a data service? It's kind of, it beats the purpose of, of working with data. We just want to look at the data. But why do we care is that with the networking, that is essentially telling you, can, can I reach my destination? So how your networking is configured determines whether you can get your data from where you need to get it, for example, or whether you can push to the, the data where you need to get it. Also, the networking, how it's configured, will determine which route should you take to that destination. So it's pretty much going to tell you, are you going to ride the highway or <laughs> are you going to take a forest route, for example? So it's, it's going to tell you which direction it's going to route the traffic to that data source or to the target that you're trying to take it to. And when we talk about access control on that side, this is talking about then if you are able to reach the destination, it's talking about can I actually get in to the service? But also then if you do get in, it's talking about what can I do there? So just to have a very functional data platform, these things need to be done in a proper way because most of the time you're going to face the networking and access control when it's not working. So that's kind of when you're in that situation that, uh oh, it's kind of not right. And then you can be kind of calm when you don't notice it at all, then everything is going fine. So let's start with the networking portion first. So as we're talking about Azure Synapse Analytics and Azure Synapse Analytics is one of the platform services in Azure. And if you've been working with any of the platform services in Azure, you know that traditionally, especially two, two three years back when you were working with these, the only option for these were that you would have a public endpoint. And that is still the case when you create an Azure Synapse Analytics workspace, you get a public endpoint. But we do have some functionality that we can use to restrict access to it. And, and what we have is some firewall rules here. 
But what can be done with this firewall is quite limited at this moment, at least. There's only two things that we can do within Azure Synapse Analytics at this point. So we can either uh, allow Azure services to access the workspace, or we can create IP whitelists. So tell from which IP address can the traffic come in. And the thing is, there is one firewall for the whole workspace environment. That means that everything that you have within it, you're not able to, for example, re restrict uh, networking access to just the SQL on demand in one way. So it's kind of one set of rules for the whole workspace. And that makes it so that we don't have a whole lot of granularity to how we can do this. So what are our options? What can we do about this? Because this is a preview uh, service, these all these features are still uh, developing quite a lot. And at this point, what we have is that we have virtual networks that you can link with your environment that are called managed workspace virtual networks. That means that if you create your Azure Synapse Analytics workspace with a managed workspace VNet, then you have a VNet for your workspace that you do not have much control over, to be honest. So you do get a virtual network and it is completely managed by Synapse. And it allows for your all those components within your Azure Synapse Analytics workspace to be isolated in an in from the networking perspective. So you're more able to create kind of your own bubble where your services live. And the one thing to consider at this point is that uh, at this point, once you choose to go either without the managed workspace VNet or with the managed workspace VNet, you cannot change that after you have put your service up. So that means you have to choose which way you go from the very get go at this very moment. So what happens with this managed workspace VNet is that that means that the Spark pool will get created within a subnet in that virtual network. So that gets completely added to that virtual network, just like a virtual machine could be in a virtual network. But when we talk about the SQL on demand and SQL pool, those are in uh, on the multi-tenant services. So that means that they cannot be directly added to the virtual networks. But what you can do is create private endpoints. And with those private endpoints, you can then link those services into your virtual network. So the private endpoints reserve a private IP address for your service from that virtual network. And then you configure this connection that this specific resource can talk with this private endpoint. So you create a private link between those two. And this way you get much more control over where uh, traffic can come in from and where also your workspace can talk with which services. And at this moment, there's an interesting note about this, that in the future, all outbound traffic will not be allowed except through these private endpoints. So any Azure resource then that you would have that you, for example, want to pull data from, you would have to link that with the private endpoint to this managed workspace VNet as well to be able to call that data or put data in there. But this kind of gives you much more granularity uh, virtual network wise. The one thing is that, as I said, it is managed. You do not have much control over the virtual network. That is both a positive and a negative. It means you cannot configure your own rules or make exceptions or anything like that. You kind of get what comes out of the box and you cannot change it. But depending on the two setups that we went through, whether you kind of work from the private or no public endpoint side, where you have that URL that you access and just the firewall to configure, or you go with a managed workspace VNet, 
that will depend on what kind of environment you have, which way you need to go. And we will get back to that at a later phase. The second part I want to talk about regarding access control. So regarding securities access control. So previously we talked about the networking and that will allow us to be able to access the services from Synapse that we want to, but also uh, restrict the traffic to our Synapse workspace that we do not want to get there. And as we just start creating Azure Synapse, uh, in the very first phase, we kind of see these, these hints that the access control not, might not be as straightforward as, as we think, because it right away tells you that we will automatically grant these rights to the workspace identity. And if you want other people to be able to do anything within here, you need to assign some more permissions to them. And it talks about contributors and workspace SQL and Spark admins and so on. So there's many, many parts to it. So how do we make sense to it? If we look at the whole workspace and kind of the parts that are within it, we have kind of two levels of access control that we work with. The first level is Azure RBAC. So if you've been working with Azure, you're probably very familiar with this. So these are the basic rules that you can assign to any Azure resources that you have. And what these Azure RBAC rights give you the access to is they give you no access to inside the workspace, but they give you access to manage the workspace. And then within that uh, Azure Synapse Analytics workspace, we also have Azure Synapse workspace roles. And with this, you cannot manage the platform, but you can get specific rights within the workspace itself to do specific tasks. And if we look a little more closely at the Azure RBAC side, we do have those same roles that we have for any other Azure service. We have the owner and the contributor and the reader as the three main roles. And the owner can do all the management tasks that need to be done. And also they can add other, give access to other users as well and add some RBAC roles to them as well. With the contributor role, again, you can manage everything, but you cannot add access to other people and you cannot add any roles to them. And then as the last one, we have the reader role, which can only see what services are within this. So what does this mean in practice? So if we have, for example, the owner or the contributor role, that means that we can manage all these components that uh, are kind of part of the uh, compute side of the Synapse Analytics workspace. And from what level can we then manage these? It's exactly that we can only manage. And what that means is that we can create them, we can modify them, we can delete them, we can start and stop compute, we can scale and so on. But all of these tasks are at the management layer. And we cannot go in, for example, into the Azure Synapse Analytics Studio with owner rights because you do not have access within the workspace itself. And ask me how I know, because I, I've managed to lock myself out of my Azure Synapse Analytics workspace. And even though I had my owner rights, I somehow managed to delete my workspace admin rights and what happened then that I couldn't get in at all after that. So even if you have owner or contributor rights, it does not mean you can do anything with data within the Synapse Analytics workspace. And to have those rights to do things within the workspace, we need the uh, uh, Azure Synapse workspace roles. And within these roles, we again have three main levels, but which are vastly different than the RBAC roles. So we have the workspace admin, Spark admins, and SQL admins. And with these different roles, you can of course do different things. And the names of these might give you a little hint of what can be done with, with which one. 
And with a workspace admin, that means you get access to the entire workspace. That means, for example, that you can create and modify pipelines. You can do development on both the SQL and Spark engines. But for example, you cannot create a Spark pool or an SQL pool. So the workspace roles are more on the development side of things and getting access to the data itself. Then if we look at the Spark admins, that one does not have the rights to create pipelines, but they do have rights to do development on Spark. And in addition to that, they, for example, have rights to write data into SQL on demand databases if you have them. So then you are able to develop on Spark and use the SQL uh, connectors and develop there and write data to the SQL database as well. So that's pretty useful. And then as the last role, we have the SQL admins. And it's very similar to the Spark one, but on the other side, you have access to development on SQL. And as I said, if you're just doing this for yourself, you're creating a proof of concept environment, for example, that means that from the get go, you will have all the needed access as you go along the setup process. And then you might bump into these issues when you start adding more people and you have more people working on this project. So now that we have looked at the security side of things as well, from the networking perspective and access control perspective. And we have looked also at the components of Azure Synapse. And now it kind of comes to the fact that, well, how do I put all this together? How do I make this suit the project I'm going to start work with? Which parts of this do I choose? And how do I choose, for example, which networking option I take? So, we have to consider, of course, always the components. Then we need to consider access management and networking as well. But what do we do with those parts? And of course, it depends on what kind of environment you have, what kind of project do you have, and what kind of project are you working with? So for example, if you have a setup where you have a small team, working in a, on a data project, you have a few data sources where you want to pull some data from. And some of these are even SaaS applications and open data, so you can just reach them over the internet. And you want to create some predictive data for a custom app and have, have that, use that data to find predictions out of as we go along. So then if we kind of start to look at the different parts of Synapse, we notice that, yeah, well, when we even set it up, yes, we get Azure Data Lake storage and we get some pipelines. So at this point, we have the uh, possibility to move around our data, uh, trigger some, some kind of workflows and things like that. And we can store our data in the Azure Data Lake storage. But we do need some more functionality here. We can't quite get to where we want to with just these two parts. We also need some kind of analytics engine. And theoretically, you could use any of these. Because for example, in the phase where you just want to uh, explore the data that you have, you could use the SQL on demand, for example. And then when you want to start working on those predictive models, you could then move to the Spark pool, for example, and do some more extensive analytics using that power of the Spark engine. And then, for example, for the serve layer, you could then, again, have just the SQL on demand where the aggregated data is ready for the custom map. And of course, always when you consider which tools and which engines you use, you also need to consider what do your people know? What does your team know? Where do they have skills in already? So if they've never used Spark, it could be a bit of a learning curve to get started there. But then it could be very easy to just work on the SQL side. But then on the other hand, if you have people who have been working with Spark extensively, they're going to say that you don't need SQL for anything because they can do so many things in Spark. So there's always different factors that we need to consider. 
And then as our data moves from our data sources and through the different analytics engines and into where we want to serve it from, then it can be pulled by the custom map in this case. So the consumer for the data that we create with our Azure Synapse Analytics space, it does not always need to be just for visualization, but it can be consumed by any kind of uh, end app that we have and we want to use it from. But of course, situations can differ quite extensively from others. And on the other hand, it is possible that you have a data project where you have many teams working together and the different teams are doing different aspects of the projects. So some can be just focused on the integration part, how to get the data moving and so on. And then the other team might be just focused on creating the data models and querying the data and, and, and kind of massaging the data into the right form. But also there can be many data sources and it is possible that all of this is in internal networks. And the end goal is to get this into reporting and then as a next step, for example, machine learning. So if we have this kind of setup, we immediately know that, okay, we have many teams. That means that we have to take much more consideration into the access management. We have to define what kind of roles each of the teams needs also on the RBAC level, as well as within the workspace roles. Then as we have internal networks, and that can even be a security requirement that we cannot have any public endpoints on our data platform, that all of it has to be in an isolated environment. That means we need to use a managed network to do that. But if we consider the services that we would need from Azure Synapse, of course, again, out of the box, we get data lake storage and pipelines and even the on-demand SQL. And since we want to visualize the data, that means we would, of course, link Power BI to our service as well. But of course, to get that data moving and get it in the form that we want to, it means that we need those analytics engines again. And whenever you have more teams, it is more likely that you're going to use more of the tools that are within Azure Synapse Analytics because it is more likely that you have will have different skill sets within your team. And thus, it's important to know that when you're starting with Azure Synapse, you could get started with just Azure Data Lake Storage pipelines and SQL on demand. And with that, you could get very far, far with your data and uh, starting to get the first things available in your Power BI, for example. But then when you do want to expand it and you want to take more capabilities in, then you can take, take in the SQL pools and the Spark pools and start, start bringing more functionality in and get much more out of your data. So we have now covered the components of Azure Synapse Analytics. What happened? That's not right. We have covered securing Azure Synapse Analytics, so how, how the networking and access control work. And we have also covered how to use Azure Synapse Analytics. And that means that you have everything that you need to get started on your data project. It means that you know what the different components do and how you can get started. You can just pop up your Azure Synapse Analytics and start with the SQL on demand and start working with your data from the get-go. But you also need know that when your team grows and your needs grow, you can add some of the functionalities more and you know how to secure your Azure Synapse Analytics workspace as well. Even though with the networking side, you cannot really change your direction after you've started at this point. But also we have looked at some of the use case scenarios of which options and which parts of Azure Synapse Analytics you would use in different use cases. So hopefully that means that you have some tools that you can get started with and you know how to choose which parts of the service you want to leverage. So at this point, I would like to see if we have any questions. I think there are.
Yes, yes, there are certainly a couple of questions. And thank you so much for this uh, for this amazing clear story on Azure Synapse. It all brought everything together. It was, it was very, very nice. And I really loved you zoomed in on the practical security side of things. Um, that is, sometimes it, it, we, we forget those those practices. So that was very useful. Yeah. Uh, but we've got some questions as well. Um, we had one uh, of the viewers that said, we use Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Bricks, and Power BI right now. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a perfect approach to handle the future developments with Synapse Analytics, or any changes are suggested? So since Azure Synapse Analytics is still in preview, so I would not recommend it for production workloads at this point. For me, it sounds very exciting because you get all those parts that you have, for example, in ADIF and Databricks and Power BI, you get them in the same place. But the thing is that it's not quite production ready yet. So it's not quite there yet. But I like looking at the direction that it's going in, it does seem like those parts will fall in there very well and you can use them. Uh, I would imagine that into the future, it's going to get really easy to then import, for example, your ADF Azure Data Factory pipelines into Azure Synapse as well, because that is just behind the scenes, those pipelines are just code and they're defined in, in a specific format. And you could just bring that into the Synapse Analytics workspace as well. Okay. So I don't think you're by having those different services, I don't think you're locking in yourself into anything specific. In the future, you would be able to complement all of that with Azure Synapse as well, because you can keep working with Databricks on your storage account that you also link with Azure Synapse Analytics, because there's no, you have separate control for how your data lake storage can be controlled because it's not really within this workspace. It is just linked to the workspace. So that is kind of the positive that you can keep working on those parts. And then if you do need something from the Azure Synapse side, you can kind of expand your environment with that one. And if you do at some point choose to move the pipelines from Azure Data Factory there, I am imagining it will be made very easy in the future. Okay, very good. Thank you for the, the amazing answer. It was very complete. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, thanks for the presentation. I really loved your slides. Did you, did you draw them yourself or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's really clear. <laughs> so it really, really gets the point across. So uh, very nice. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how my mind looks. So you yeah. got a little peek into how I think when I read all the documentation and how it's all starts to fit together. Yeah, but it, I mean, it was really great. It was really clear to me how it works. So uh, thanks. Um, well, I, I, I have another question and, it, and it's uh, data size related. So is there any like minimum or maximum or maybe like a sweet spot where you would, where you would start with this service or stop? Yeah. So earlier when we just had Azure Data Warehouse uh, and that was then branded to Azure Synapse Analytics, for example, in Finland, we don't, not many customers have those really big data scenarios yet. And the amounts of data are still quite small. And then the thing is that the data warehouse would be a little expensive in that case. And even now it is, it is part of the Azure Synapse Analytics and you can use it. But the nice thing now is that you can also start without it. So you don't necessarily need to start using the data warehouse or the, which is the formerly known Azure Data Warehouse side, the provisioned at SQL pool. Mm -hmm. You don't have to start using that until you have that mass of data that you require it for. And we also need to remember that it's really that it has that massively parallel processing engine. So if you have, you kind of need the type of queries that benefit from that. So if your queries are not that type, then you're kind of misusing that uh, engine and you're not getting that additional performance even out of it if you're not, your queries are not of that kind of nature. So, I, I would say you do need uh, 
I don't know what the exact number is, but you need m kind of more data to make that uh, make that useful. The thing now with the data warehouse is that you can also start and stop it, the provision pool. So that means that if you have some big batch processing that you need to do at any point, you could leverage that at those times when you need that batch processing and just use it for the time that you need it. So there's very flexible ways in which you can leverage these different components and functionalities. Okay, well, that's a good tip. Yeah. Thanks. We also had another other question. Is the work in analytics engines version in Git? So is it as code or is it just a lot of work in the portal? Um, with the Azure Data Factory side, the pipeline side, which has been brought into Azure Synapse, with that, you can set up Git with it. So with that code, yes, you can link it directly to GitHub and have it pulled and have your branches and have people working on different branches and pull it together. I have to say, I cannot remember straight off my head whether it is true on the side where you are, for example, developing your SQL queries or your notebooks on Spark or your Spark jobs and so on. But um, we can double check that and make sure we get an answer. But yes, on the data factory and pipeline side, definitely, which also makes it that if you were using Azure Data Factory previously, you could just link your Synapse pipelines section to that GitHub and have that pulled in as well. Very cool. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question, Joris? Or yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. We have like a few minutes left. So let's um, do the last one. If you if you still have one, that is. Yeah, I have, I have one burning burning in our pocket that is going to help us with next month's session. So. <laughs> I'm going to ask that, that bold question because in, in a month's time we're having um, Rohan Kumar, the corporate vice mm -hmm. president for Azure Data at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. He will be uh, doing a session with us, uh, so that's pretty cool. But we're yeah. new, and you're you're the, this huge expert on, on uh, Synapse Analytics. And is there any question we we should ask him? What 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 is should we ask him when it when it's it's ready for production, or do we have a better question? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> I have many questions, actually. <laughs> but you can always, always, always relate them to us uh, after the session. So that's always yeah, very helpful, so, yeah. Uh, for example, I'm I'm interested on the networking side because for me, the managed uh, workspace managed network at this point it's super stiff. You just see a yes somewhere that you have this managed network but you have no way to make exceptions to that and especially if they do lock that all outbound traffic it's gonna make things a little tricky in the future so for example that one is a bit of like are you is it gonna stay this way or are you gonna make it a little more flexible are you going to improve on it okay well we'll, we'll make sure he gets that question uh, yeah yeah yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Really and I just you. You're welcome. It's, it was really fun to be here. And I just want to encourage everybody to go out there and go into the Azure portal and get your Synapse workspace started and start playing with the data. There's a whole lot of uh, good tutorials on the documentation site that you can get started with and kind of play around and poke around and and even bring your own data and see what you can find. So it's really easy to get started. For sure. Well, they have to wait another hour because we have an excellent session after it. Yeah. <laughs> Dave coming in uh, on, on data breaks and data factory uh, synapse and uh, I think some Power BI, but Dave will amaze us with some awesome content. But so I think you'll get even more answers to when would you go Azure Synapse way or when would you go, for example, Azure Data Factory and so on. So I think yep. it's a good yeah. good continuation. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. See you next time. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So is it already time?